button. And we're rolling. All right, excellent. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's January 27th. January is flying by. So um, exploring GoToMeeting now. I originally signed up for Zoom in 2019. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a big hit. Maybe I should look in, see if they're publicly traded and buy some stock. And unfortunately, I didn't follow through on that idea. And it had already gone 10x that amount by the time I looked at it again later in 2020. But I signed up in Europe. So I've been paying in euros since then. And they wouldn't allow me to switch over to dollars. So I had to. Um, Find the right time to drop or cancel my 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 plan, and so all the previous recordings are no longer available uh, on Zoom. Um, all these uh, previous uh, Zoom recordings that I did on the products, but I am considering putting them up on some uh, um, video service, whether that's YouTube or or another one. I haven't decided, but stay tuned for that. But meanwhile, I'm um, giving this a shot, and uh, I think I'm, I'm figuring it out. Go to meeting. So hopefully this works well for all of you. And today, what I'm going to do is um, explore some of our products on the website. Um, briefly, for those who are just uh, maybe those who would be watching this later, if you're just uh, tuning into these product presentations now, very quick brief tour of the website when you're looking for something if you haven't already arrived via a Google search you can use this just hover over the products uh, tab and it'll show you all the major categories but if you have something specific you can type it up here um, whether it's and then it'll start populating so it, even if you're not sure um, how to spell something I guess if you spelled skullcap wrong, you'd still um, you'd still find your way there because I spelled it with just one L and then put in the C and I was still there. So this a uh, relatively intelligent search function there. Um, unfortunately, when you put stuff in like cough, there's not as much anymore. There used to be um, tags associated with all the products, and I had to remove those, and that's part of the reason why we started. I started doing these product presentations. So, um, you know, Ill illnesses or tag words are far less uh, effective now, but you can also see a whole list of tags here when you're on the main product page. Okay, those are just some pointers on how to navigate. Uh, let's see if I can reload. There we go. Um, I also have a lot of information that is not, uh, it is searchable. I don't know about every word, but certainly keywords and titles. Um, this is basically a blog. And so um, just the top three entries are from last year, and then everything else is several years previous. I have a number of plant profiles. You have Santa, Puncture Vine, Holy Basil's in there. Um, post on acorns. And there's a couple pages worth of, of posts there. Some of them replicated from my um, my personal site, johnjslattery.com. And also, if anyone else is new viewing this, frequently asked questions when you have questions about shipping, uh, ingesting herbal tinctures, how long they last, and so forth, and general other general questions about our products. It's a good page to to start because these questions all come from the most frequently asked questions uh, I receive. Okay, so back to hovering over products, we got the major categories. We've got our tinctures, our salves and infused oils. We make all of the infused oils in-house from the herbs that we gather. Predominantly, it's about 90, 95% is what I gather myself and occasionally purchase organically grown herbs for the infused oils. Uh, syrups, honeys, and oxymels. So there's a variety of products there. Uh, beverages that includes all the tea and cocoa blends and my screen's a bit blocked I can't quite see over there I move something on the far side um, miscellaneous so herbal soup could also be in the beverages section but uh, fire cider salt which will be coming back soon fire cider 
a number of dry herbs, my books, and if you'd like to book a consultation, a uh, 15 or 30 minute short consultation, those are available there. And then also, uh, I don't have it in the upper echelon menu, but my daughter's um, baked goods, why do I keep doing that? I wanna move this over. Um, you could also just type in baked, I would think, bakery, no, that doesn't work. Okay, we're learning live here. Baked, there we go. So um, she just uploaded some more brownies. Uh, that's her new logo, my 10-year-old daughter. Uh, she designed that herself, and we just got it printed on stickers. So she's super excited about that and just made a fresh batch of gluten-free brownies. So I love promoting her work. She's um, She's very enthusiastic about her baking, very inspired. Uh, it's part of her homeschool or unschool, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this afternoon, she's making macarons for the first time in her mixer uh, with butternut squash from our garden. Uh, instead of a pumpkin spice, she's doing butternut squash spice. So she's really excited for that. Anyhow, enough of that, but those are available limited time if you'd like to include that in one of your orders. What we're going to look at today are tincture formulas. So in this tincture category, it's the top section. And if we click on there, it'll show us all of the 18 tincture formulas currently available. Now, I would say that I created all of these, but that's not quite true. At one point it was. However, um, the CV1, 2, and 3 and prevention um, are largely influenced uh, by Stephen Buhner's work uh, of the last couple years. And then I would also say the LR formula, lung repair, short for lung repair. Those are largely influenced by his work. So I have covered those quite a bit. I'm going to refrain from looking at those today unless somebody who's here, oh my goodness. Um, We've meet, reached our limit at five attendees. I didn't realize I was going to be capped at five attendees. That was not made clear. So I'm, I'm doing the free trial right now uh, from this um, provider. And uh, sorry about that. All right. Well, everyone will be able to I am recording it. So that's, that's good. That's unfortunate. Okay. So... Um, Good Lord, I keep doing that. What we're going to do is um, skim through some of these formulas here. Um, some of my original formulas go back to cold and flu formula, aka immune formula. So I renamed it to satisfy the FDA, but kept the same label and kept this image, and they didn't say anything about it. So that may cause some confusion, but um, if you purchase this from us, the label will still say cold and flu formula, but we call it immune formula. And frankly, I like, I like the name immune formula a little bit better now, but let's get into it a bit. Uh, what did I create here? I created something that was based on what I had available to me from uh, the local herbal resources plus licorice root which in this case is not a, a, a local licorice route. This is one from International Commerce, which it has been in International Commerce for uh, centuries. And um, come back to that, but these are some of the major herbs utilized for acute onset illness in the greater Southwest region and beyond, both in traditional folk medicine and in Upon the advent of organized, let's call it um, uh, medicine, uh, prof organized professional medicine, um, maybe mid to late 1800s, you know, certainly by the Civil War era and probably before then, that had uh, started to take root here in, in the Southwest, probably more likely in Southern California and then you know sparsely in this region. But I know by the late 1800s, there were uh, excuse me, um, osteopaths uh, practicing in this region, Tombstone, for example. 
Um, I know one of my daughter's ancestors was there practicing as an osteopath. So people used herbs in a professional practice setting and wrote about them. So there's a little bit of reference there. Yerba Mansa being one of them, um, but that, that was taken directly from uh, traditional folk practice, as, was, um, as were all of the herbs that were put into practice since maybe as early as the 17th and early 18th centuries in the Northeast and along the Atlantic seaboard and other places of uh, you know, dense colonial presence. Uh, those herbs were integrated into uh, what we might call the Western um, uh, practice, physician's practice at that time, and they were brought in from you know, personal relationships that individuals had with Native peoples and, and, um, and or what one physician learned from a local practitioner and passed it on to his colleagues. So I would say that my formulas uh, take on that tradition to some extent as I'm combining what I've learned directly from folk herbalists that I encountered and worked with uh, and the extent written uh, uh, knowledge, ethnobotanical knowledge, and coupled with whatever, whatever so-called scientific or clinical knowledge that was available on these plants, which arguably is quite, quite small and re, you know, uh, considerably small relative to the ethnobotanical lore. So that's a context for a broader context for all these formulas, and the cold and flu or immune formula is no exception whatsoever. So Yerba Mansa, I started talking about that has been one of the most popular. Oh, sorry about that. Um, that has been one of the most popular uh, folk herbs for both internal and external use for centuries, I would imagine. Uh, I've spoken about um, Yerba Mansa, I believe, uh, recently, and um, there's a lot written on it, including, I believe, a write-up here on my blog. And Yerba Mansa um, has a particular affinity for the mucous membranes and the mucous membranes cover the respiratory tract, the digestive tract, and the genitourinary tract. So in that case, it has a very wide uh, range of application. In addition, it has a particular affinity for the sinuses. So I would say any, any, any chronic or acute situation where the sinuses are affected, affected, um, your romance can be very valuable. So that seems to be, from what I'm hearing, what a lot of people have been experiencing, what's been going around, whatever it may be, um, that uh, Yerba Mansa um, would be an excellent um, aid in the body's vital response to relieving itself of toxicity or illness. And part of that is, a big part of that is the lymph. And the lymph is integrated throughout the body it's a very subtle aspect of our detoxification mechanism, and it seems that a great many people have been overloaded, and uh, severely so. And Yeromansa is a great way to take the back pressure off of uh, the immune system via the lymph system to, i.e., prevent illness. Also, during the acute throes of it, Yeromansa is, is aiding in that same way, and also in recovery to help clear the detritus and the waste products that accumulate uh, due to the you know, hyper excitation of immune system in response to a foreign bodies or uh, release of toxins from the body. So Yerba serves several roles here in what I've already highlighted, uh, as well as helping to um, move fluid within the lungs in a more subtle way than, say, Yerba Santa or Spikenard or particularly Osha would. So each of those four herbs, well, I would include elephant tree in that as well, and to some extent licorice, ha each have a way of um, either liquefying phlegm that's stuck in the lungs or present in the lungs at the very least to um, 
causing it to move upward and outward. Phlegm may have an immediate uh, relevance within the lung as a consequence of uh, immunological excitation that prevents direct injury to the tissue, the epithelial tissue, but it, it can quickly overstay its welcome and accumulate such as to make for adverse ecological conditions within the lungs. That's something that we saw a lot in, in 2020, presumably as people were um, drowning in their own phlegm, in their own fluid, in their lungs. So um, I wouldn't say that uh, it's a miracle cure for that per se, but each of those herbs in their own way supports the, um, it's called the rectification of phlegm within the lungs. And to some extent can actually help promote fluid fluidity of, of mucus across the mucous membranes. Your Ramonsa is especially good for that when, when it, um, when it's, there's an inappropriate amount. And then as it becomes excessive and begins to accumulate, i.e. in a situation where someone um, may have a reluctant cough or a cough that's non-productive or a cough that's producing colored phlegm, that phlegm is almost like a vehicle. It's like an ingenious, you know, we don't have a, a, a rag for our lungs. We don't have a mop. For our lungs, but we have phlegm, which can, in a way, kind of congeal toxins and heat and pull that out. And then when the coughing mechanism is, that vitality is present in our body, allows us to expectorate it. When expectoration is inhibited, well then, you know, that, that can cause for a festering of that phlegm and a buildup of toxicity and people can develop, you know, let's say that, um, the toxicity, the disease process can deepen itself into the tissues, causing further initial or, and or further organic dysfunction of the tissue. So that's where a lot of these herbs really help for respiratory conditions. Uh, I've spoken to some of my clients who have taken this as a prophylactic um, to prevent themselves from getting sick. And, um, you know, there's so many different, I see so many different viewpoints on how you could conceive of that. Um, you know, one of the things that we may largely underappreciate as human beings is the, um, you know, the near miss. You know, when we made the decision to go one way instead of the other and the tree falls down on that trail and we never knew about it, but we just gleefully go on our way. Or... We say, oh, I don't feel like going to the store right now. I'll wait a bit. And we miss the car accident that would have been right in our path. Uh, or we have an insight. I should eat this food more often or eat this food less often or remove this food or take some of these herbs. And as a consequence, you know, walk down that path where the tree doesn't fall on us. So um, there's a, uh, hopefully this isn't too tangential, but there's a saying amongst um Chinese physicians, traditional Chinese physicians, i.e. Chinese medicine, um, that a, uh, a well-trained doctor can observe a patient, take their pulse, uh, uh, read their tongue, maybe ask them a question, and get a, a real clear concept of what's happening with them. An even more skilled practitioner can simply feel the pulse and read the tongue and not ask them any questions and know just what's happening with them. An even more refined practitioner can watch someone walk through the door, take two steps, and know just what they're suffering from. Yet someone that's even at a higher stage of understanding and refinement in their concepts of the cosmology and how this manifests in each of us will see that person take those two steps and know what to treat them for so that they won't get sick three months from now. So it's all in gradations of understanding the flow of energy, the flow of movement. Um, as the tide comes in, we're already aware to some extent, if you have a tide map, that the tide will be going out. So to prepare for the tide on its way out, 
without you know thinking that you know you start moving your house from from the edge of the shore, seashore because you think the tide's never going to stop coming in well you know that it's eventually going to move out too so it's moving with these with these ebbs and flows okay hopefully that wasn't too tangential uh, and it lends some insight to how I see how we can utilize herbs but this this formula um, although it's called immune formula is largely um, largely focused on the respiratory system yet we also have red root so I've talked about red root a lot uh, or repeatedly I should say over the past several months and red root uh, is a very important herb in many settings and I feel is even more important now and I'll reiterate what I've said in the past a very simply it's one of our I, I believe it's our, our number one lymphatic remedy um, bar none I don't know an exemption from this continent or another continent uh, this tradition or another tradition of herb use um, to my knowledge is the best there is and not only that red root has a subtle affinity for the blood such that it will help improve the charge of the blood and allow for the blood vessels to repel each other more effectively uh, and therefore allow for um, uh, better fluidity of the blood or a tendency to resist clotting a tendency to resist stickiness so the blood can become sticky in response to uh, a number of things but uh, you know when Michael Moore taught he often focused on dietary effects how um, either alcohol processed foods or um, excessively fatty meals let's call them indulgently fatty meals that were overloading the body too quickly and thereby rendering the blood more sluggish and so he recognized through the use of a dark field microscope and taking samples of blood before and after sampling red root tincture that red root would enable the movement of the blood the corpuscles i believe would become more resilient to uh, repelling each other rather than you know sluggishly meeting and glomming onto each other and then accumulating so that thick sticky blood um, you know creates a tendency towards thrombosis and that's kind of like the, the issue du jour that we've been dealing with for most of the past couple of years in response to the let's just call it the the environmental toxicity at the very least that is contributing to these blood disorders and as as a means of combating or protecting oneself from these blood disorders uh, sage advice has recommended blood thinning agents or um, avoiding things that might contribute negatively to the coagulation of blood and I believe that in terms of herbs one of our more important remedies uh, for that purpose is, is red root and that's part of my CV3 formula so um, it is otherwise very effective in all acute illnesses especially so um, to help resolve um, any degree of toxicity that enters the blood that would cause blood clotting and I think that's something that is re-emerging in our consciousness both in the so-called modern scientific milieu the scientific reductive rationalist realm as well as in herbalism which frankly has been part and parcel the same thing <laughs> for most of the past several decades in the so-called herbal renaissance which was uh, I believe more of an herbal takeover um, as the minds of herbalists have been captured uh, by the validation mechanism of, of Western reductive reasoning. And so we had to rush to prove ourselves in that realm and leave behind a great deal of the wisdom of folk herb herbalism and the traditions of herbalism east and west, north and south, however you want to phrase it, but definitely of different backgrounds. Uh, we knew we knew and we understood things deeply and it's been hijacked and replaced with a co-opted form of reasoning that undermines a lot of the the capability present in oneself um, becoming informed and aware and being able to utilize nature to a high a degree of high effectiveness not just a quaint substitution that wouldn't that be pretty wouldn't that be nice um, 
to simply dance through the daisies and, and feel happy and, and spry. But there's powerful healing in nature, that I can say for sure. And red root is a significant part of that. Osha, another important part of that, is the lead herb in this formula. I gather the osha myself from the mountains in Colorado when possible. And it's a fresh plant tincture. Um, I think the most recent batch I had, I was able to let macerate for over a year. Very, very potent um, tincture, high quality. And osha root is near the top of the list, along with yerba mansa, in terms of folk uh, appreciation of these plants, both in a physical sense and the metaphysical or spiritual sense. Osha has been a protective remedy for many people for, um, for centuries, millennia. Um, it has been used um, as, to ward off snakes, and it's been used uh, as prayer and ceremony. Uh, it was so valued that I believe it's the Menominee, if I'm remembering correctly, um, a largely light-skinned, um, light-haired, and even um, light-eye-colored race of so-called indigenous peoples uh, now known from Wisconsin area, maybe Minnesota, that they had a um, they had a ceremony, an annual ceremony that went back centuries uh, in which uh, they utilized OSHA. And that would have been um, that would have been um, uh, derived from trade, most likely from close to a thousand miles away. Uh, straight west towards the foothills of outside of Denver. That would have been maybe the closest area that they would have had to harvest it from. So it's a very interesting anecdote about the import of, of OSHA, that particular species, and all the way down deep into Mexico. OSHA, Chuchupate, uh, Bear Root, uh, Hunalpi, as the Hopi call it. Very important herb, loved by the bears, and uh, as they say in Chinese, um, lore, the bear taught the people about the medicine, and there are some stories about that in uh, traditional Native American um, herbal medicine as well. So Osha here is very warming, uh, stimulates uh, the blood flow, stimulates um, fluid movement and excretion, uh, as well as digestive juices throughout the whole body. Uh, it's one of my favorite herbs for an acute onset sore throat and fever. Um, I may take uh, take a fresh root of it or dry root, more likely, uh, uh, or some chunks of the root that have been soaked in honey, and put that in, soak, suck on it, and chew on the root, and cover myself up in blankets and um, try to sweat it out. Also, very very stimulating. Um, also protective of the blood as well. Osha has been used topically and internally for snake bites and spider bites. As I mentioned earlier, it's also as a uh, means of warding off snakes. I've heard of people putting the roots in their shoelaces uh, to um, making a tea and spraying it around the house or putting it into uh, spraying it around uh, uh, the base of the home yeah, to keep rattlesnakes away. So let me say something just to wrap up about the this formula. It is overall warming and stimulating. And so I think it works best in an acute situation. Um, but the right people evidently can take it long term. And where, where that's balanced out in particular is the licorice root. Uh, licorice root is in there. It's a harmonizing agent, meaning that it helps uh, coalesce the different energies of the herbs together um, and it is a bit moist and cool in its nature and then spikenard which I didn't say much about spikenard when I am able to use um, wild crafted spikenard from our region uh, I do know that it has a particularly sweet quality that is quite nutritive um, deeply Nutritive in the sense that you can feel it in the depths of your nervous system and the adrenals. Uh, it's, a, it's a relative of ginseng, 
it's actually the namesake of the family, the Aureliaceae, but it is nowhere near as stimulating, but has a bit more of an affinity for the lungs as a restorative remedy. So I think spikenard, in terms of its breadth and depth of, of medicinal prowess, is perhaps one of the top five underappreciated herbs uh, that we have, um, at least in the Southwest um, if not in much of the country, because you can actually find Aurelia racemosa growing natively in um, in parts of, of the East. I don't know to what extent, I don't recall to what extent it is there, but I know it, it can be found in abundance in places like North Carolina, maybe Virginia, um, probably Maryland, and so forth in those regions, as well as a related, closely related species in California, or Aurelia californica. So those can be largely um, uh, interchanged. So this is, this is one of my personal go-tos. Uh, if I have um, something, as I described, upper respiratory acute illness, sore throat, cough, cold, um, and I like to couple that, since I'm on the subject, with my Yerba Santa Oxymel, which has some related plants in there. Of course, the Yerba Santa, and then I also use um, Aurelia in this one as well, and then the ginger, clove, and anise uh, combine to generate some heat and blood movement and diffusion, and then elecampane is added in because it's a it's a fantastic cough remedy. Uh, so it supports spikenard and yerba santa, which are also great cough remedies, but I've seen elecampane help when the other two didn't. So this is another really good all-around upper respiratory aid and cough remedy uh, for acute illness. So personally, I will often take Yerba Santa Oxymel if I'm feeling sick enough to where that's my focus and I'm not really doing anything else. Definitely loading up on this and some hot water with a few squirts of the, um, the immune formula, cold and flu, that we just looked at. And then uh, when I have it, I will be doing Osha Honey and secondarily, wild oregano honey. And if those were all out, then I would be doing the holy basil honey. Because um, these on their own can be fantastic. Uh, so one thing I heard recently that people had um, were experiencing uh, uh, a dry, hectic cough towards the end of their illness. And uh, it was unresolved. Um, one person used manuka honey. And I said, well, you know, for the price, uh, you know, you can try some of our local uh, wildflower honey, and which can be, uh, you know, certainly a fraction of the cost of manuka honey. If you ever get a chance to get some um, natural, i.e., you know, the bees are simply consuming what's available in the Sonoran Desert region, our Sonoran Desert honey is some of the more medicinal honey that you can find. I take that and then pour it over. These are the bergamot, wild bergamot, Monarda mentifolia flowers from, from the wild, and then infuse those um, into honey. That is a top notch uh, dry cough remedy. And so if you grow that in your garden, you can probably approximate that pretty well as well. So those are kind of my, my top things that I would be reaching for, along with maybe the, the Osha root. And um, I know I started a little bit late. I'm not sure how late, but let me see if I can just wrap up with one more formula. So one that I could probably say a lot about would be the gut health. And I've talked about uterine tonic quite a bit. Um, yeah, maybe I will mention so this is a formula that I created um, based off of some insight gained through studying for a short time with Paul Bergner uh, with his focus on healing the gut through nutrition and removal of food allergies. And so I saw the importance of creating ready-to-use remedies for people that would experience acute onset of symptoms, either digestive-related or um, 
not digestive, but directly related to the consumption of food allergies. And this formula has worked really great for a lot of people. We'll see some repeats here, um, or at least a repeat, the red root, which I was just discussing. Um, again, the red root helps move the lymph. The gut lining is made of approximately 80% lymphatic tissue. And so when people have non-digestive related symptoms associated with the consumption of a food allergen, it's often in conjunction with that uh, inflammation and swelling and bogging down of the lymph tissue in the gut, which can result, result in, uh, say, sore throat, um, or as it progresses into a you know, so-called leaky gut, the migration of toxins coming out of the gut and into the bloodstream, where, of course, red root's going to help there too, but out of the bloodstream and then maybe migrating to other tissues where biological um, mimicry, if I'm using that term correctly, uh, causes the immune system to attack our own native tissue, i.e. autoimmune. So autoimmune is a big deal these days, uh, and I think will increasingly be so. And one of the greatest ways to uh, protect yourself from autoimmune disease, to put it bluntly, is to heal your gut, keep your gut strong. What does that mean? That means different things for different people, most certainly, and uh, different things at different stages. But ultimately, it means integrity of the structural tissue of the gut with functional capacity to digest and assimilate nutrients. That's, that's basically it. And when, um, when you're not quite there yet, you need to relieve the body of the burden that it's under so that it can do what it needs to do. Okay? So, um, what else can I say quickly about that? I think I'll just state one more thing to help you understand this better. This is actually comprised of pairs. And so we have a pair of estafiate and, and ginger, um, two warming herbs that help stimulate gut function, but then the estafiate also supports uh, liver function, which is very important here. And then chamomile and peppermint, excellent digestives that allay gas, cramping, bloating. Um, and peppermint especially is a bit uh, anodyne or pain relieving in the gut. And then red root and ocotillo are lymphatic remedies. Uh, ocotillo more specifically for the pelvic lymph and red roots uh, systemic lymph. But the two of them paired together work really well to resolve that back pressure of the lymphatic stagnation that can ensue from the immunological response to the consumption of a food allergen. That's the difference between getting a sore throat or brain fog um, or feeling sluggish after consuming some gluten or dairy, for example, um, that maybe you didn't intend to eat but nonetheless uh, consumed. You take a few squirts of this right after consuming it once you realized it and you help flush the lymph and now you have more capacity to deal with the toxic release. And, uh, and you don't get overloaded. So it's, um, it's prophylactic, it's a therapeutic, and uh, it's a therapeutic in response to the consumption. And it's also just simply therapeutic overall. Uh, it can help the gut um, to be humming on all, running on all cylinders uh, and help resolve any lingering inflammation that's there. I, tend to take uh, take some of it even when my gut's doing well every every week or so just keep some in the cupboard close by all right well um, I think that's a wrap for today hopefully that was useful information and informative helps you understand our products a little bit better again that's the goal of these sessions and um, hopefully this uh, this format will work well for us. Next time, I'll work on um, whether it's uh, moving out of the free trial or whatever I need to do to allow for more than five people to join. Sorry, I wasn't aware of that. My apologies for those who tried to join but were unable. Uh, so look forward to next Thursday, which is, I know, February. I haven't done the math yet to figure out which, which day. <laughs> I looked at the calendar, but somewhere in those first few days, February. Um, 
hopefully I'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.